Hey there, marketing researchers. Welcome to the video series on secondary information and secondary research in marketing. Let's talk about the learning objectives we have for this video series. First, the phrases secondary data, secondary information, secondary research reports are often used interchangeably in common language. I'm guilty of it as well. However, we're going to briefly make a conceptual distinction between what a secondary research report is and what using secondary data for your own analysis is. Next, we'll identify several common types of secondary data used by marketers, pointing out some of the common internal and external sources of secondary information. Then, we'll identify some typical marketing uses of secondary data, and we'll be able to then explain how secondary research or secondary data is used to address common marketing problems. Finally, we'll go in depth on how to systematically critique the quality of secondary data. This will empower us to be a better judge of whether or not a secondary research report or the secondary data itself is trustworthy and appropriate for our own research. Finally, this video series is going to teach you how to use some of the common industry standard secondary data tools that's used in marketing. This is going to include identifying the proper secondary source to use for a project. It's also going to cover how to generate customized tables and charts through the basic and advanced user interfaces of some of these secondary sources. Finally, we're going to learn how to correctly interpret the numerical and quantitative information that comes out of these customized reports. Even though the terms secondary research and secondary data are often interchangeable in any given context, let's make a formal distinction between the two. When we talk about secondary research in a strict format, what we mean is that somebody else, not us, identified some sort of problem in a research question. That same other person designed a research study and collected data. They conducted analysis and they generated a research report. And then we, as part of our own ongoing research project, made some use of that research report. Maybe one of their insights, one of their tables, one of their relative important statistical values. Now, secondary data utilization, on the other hand, is when you yourself have a unique problem that you identified and you have a research question. You designed your own research study where you recognize that someone else's research design and their data collection, importantly, can be useful for your own purposes. You then using someone else's data conduct your own analysis and you yourself generate a research report. So when we use secondary data, we're really talking about conducting a start to finish research project with the one distinct difference being we're using someone else's or some other source of data that we did not generate ourselves for the project. While there's a variety of different secondary data sources, for marketing research, we need to take note that syndicated data is very common. Syndicated data is data that's available for anyone to use, even your competitors for a price. In other words, for-profit marketing research firms collect this data and then sell it for the use of other marketers. Syndicated data as an actual practice in modern marketing is usually more than just providing raw data. Most marketing syndicated data providers include sophisticated report interfaces so that marketers can customize syndicated data analysis for their unique needs. In addition, most syndicated data providers also provide their own customized research projects for individualized clients. Typically, this is much more expensive. Finally, some syndicated data providers today not only provide reporting tools and the raw data itself, but they also are now providing interfaces that allow companies to integrate the secondary syndicated data with an internal data source that the marketer is already using. A wide variety of firms provide syndicated data. In some cases, it's very boutique and specific to an industry. But let me provide two examples of very large syndicated data services. Perhaps the most notable is from Nielsen, the world's largest marketing research firm. Two of their biggest syndicated data sources is their retail measurement service, RMS, and their consumer panel service, CPS. The RMS system provides information about consumer packaged goods sales at the retail store level, while the consumer panel services provide similar information about consumer purchases, but it relies on survey response data coming directly from the consumers. These are often complementary syndicated data services providing similar but distinct insights. I don't elaborate on what each one of these services does here, 
because Nielsen itself provides an excellent quick overview of each one of the services. Follow the link provided here below and review the brief videos that covers what each one of these services does. Another example of a syndicated data provider is the Stevenson Company. TrackLine is the name of their system that tracks the sales and market information in the consumer durables category. In fact, over 250 different consumer durables, like elliptical equipment, refrigerators, stovetops. The Stevenson Company relies on elaborate and complex consumer panel survey responses to track what was purchased, why it was purchased, and what other items were considered while the consumer was making their purchase. Let's illustrate an example of using syndicated marketing data. So the tool that we're going to use here is available through the SDSU library. It's really fantastic. It's called Simply Analytics. Now, Simply Analytics isn't actually the syndicated data platform itself, but rather it's a platform that can merge and subscribe to other data sets that are for sale and then allow us to run reports and data visualizations from there. So we as SDSU students and faculty have access to this platform and within the platform, there, uh, SDSU has a subscription to Simmons Local. Simmons Local is one of the most well-known uh, annual wide-scale consumer surveys that covers an amazing array of topics. So let's illustrate that use here. We're going to create a map. Uh, my goal here is I'd like to see if I can check out uh, the percentage of vegetarians in each U.S. state. As you can see here, I already have this variable here saying I am a vegetarian, but where did that actually come from? Uh, I'm going to type in the word vegetarian here, and it looks through all of the different data sets, including Simmons Local, and identifies some variables that might be interesting to me. So if you look here, Simmons Local, Lifestyle Statements, Diet and Health. So these are the categories, one of the categories of questions that Simmons Local asks about. And if people agree a lot with the following statement, I am a vegetarian. So we can either get the number here, the raw count of individuals, or the percentage. Now, I'm interested in the percentage. Obviously, there's a lot of vegetarians in New York, Florida, uh, California. These are just large states. I want to know when there's a, where there is a high hit rate of vegetarians. So I'm going to select this here. Um, now, again, this was already selected for us. And we won't have any of these businesses. You can also overlap uh, business locations, but that's not what we need. And let's hit done. Now, by default, uh, the information is reported as people who identify as a vegetarian in the USA at the county level. And notice we have this attractive heat map and each one of the colored regions represents a county in the United States. And we can look over here on the right hand side to see what the different uh, percentages mean. Uh, you can adjust the different cut points. We're not going to worry about that right now. Now, I don't really want a county level at this point. I just want state level. And let's see what we find. So as we see here, yep, California, maybe not too surprisingly, has a high percentage of vegetarians. But so does Washington, Oregon, Georgia, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. And then we see here North Dakota, South Dakota, Arkansas, and Missouri have a very relatively low hit rate of vegetarians. And these, you know, when I say a large difference, keep in mind we're talking that in the low end it's somewhere between 2.3 to 2.8 percent and then all the way up to approximately 3.8 to 6 percent. So not necessarily a massive discrepancy in percentages, but for a marketer interested in identi identifying where there's a large percentage or hit rate of vegetarians, this is a difference of nearly 50 to 100%. So what we just illustrated here is the use of syndicated data to generate unique reports that are actually valuable for a individualized uh, marketing purpose. So this is one of the more common ways we might interface with uh, secondary research as marketing researchers. Before we wrap up this video, I need to take note that syndicated data sources is not the only place that marketing researchers today can look to to acquire raw data that they might utilize for their own projects. There's been an enormous movement in the social sciences and hard sciences fields for what's called open science, 
One aspect of this open science movement is sharing the raw data that was actually generated as part of a research project. Now this major movement that's happening in the academic fields is also influencing industry practice. In many cases, high quality marketing research firms and public polling companies are actually sharing their raw data sets as well. And we can make use of those when appropriate. Let's give an example in the next slides. So let's take a look at this secondary research report that came from Pew Research. This title says most Americans say that coronavirus outbreak has impacted their lives, published in March 30th, 2020. And as is typical with Pew Research, they have a lengthy report covering all of the different results that they find from their own internal uh, survey research. Of course, we could just use the results reported here in this report to derive relevant marketing insights if we were trying to understand how our customer or consumer behavior might have changed in result of COVID. But Pew Research, like other some other uh, large research institutions, they actually release their raw data sets as well. So I have already created an account here, which is free, and I'm actually downloading this raw data set. Now, this raw data could be read into something like Microsoft Excel, but what I'm going to illustrate here quickly is I'm going to use a piece of software called SPSS. Uh, this isn't a, a training tutorial for using SPSS. Rather, I just want to show you that, sure enough, we see this giant data set. It looks like a spreadsheet here of right over 11,537 respondents in each column represents a response to one of the survey questions. What I want to do is I noticed that there are two particular questions that are interesting to me. One, I noticed that we have a question about how frequently someone attends religious services. And also there is a question specific about someone's personal level of confidence that the medical needs of someone who are seriously ill can be accommodated for the coronavirus throughout the nation. I'd like to see if there's some sort of relationship between how confident people are in the nation's healthcare system to deal with COVID and their frequency of religious attendance. So behind the scenes here, I, I generated, uh, ran a little report here and ran it and developed a baseline chart showing the comparison of these two variables. So this is a stacked bar chart. Notice here on the X axis, each bar represents how someone may have answered to their religious service attendance. Notice the people on the left here are all the individuals who say they attended more than once a week. And within each group, this, uh, the colors represent their answer to how confident they were that the medical needs of people will be met. The blue color at the top here and the red color here represent people who are somewhat or very confident that the nation can handle the healthcare needs of people who are sick. People who attend church services more regularly are clearly more confident, on average, than people who rarely or never attend church services. So there's actually a correspondence. Uh, this could be particularly relevant. So we clearly see here some sort of association between frequency of church going and confidence levels and the ability to deal with the COVID outbreak. Uh, this may partially uh, explain or provide some insight into why there's discrepancies between uh, individuals who believe large public gatherings, including churches, should stay closed or modified, whereas other people uh, believe that church services should be uh, not covered as part of quarantining. What we've done here uh, in this brief example is we've demonstrated that secondary research reports are not the only way we might interact with secondary research. In some cases, the secondary data itself may be available. Therefore, we can investigate that secondary data, discover how they conducted their research, and then we could do our own unique analysis that may never have actually been conducted by the original people who did the research.